Welcome everybody, I'm happy to see so many of you here. I'm uh, going to give a short introduction about myself. Uh, my name is Øystein Kolstrud. I work at a company called Click in Sweden. Uh, and we develop tools for uh, uh, the business intelligence sector. It's basically a tool that allows you to do visualizations of, of big data and work with them and do queries and stuff to filter your data in there. Um, and at that company, I work primarily with C Sharp. So I'm a C Sharp developer. Uh, and I started working here a couple of years ago. And one thing that struck me was that uh, I was totally new to C Sharp at that point. And I realized that the way I was using C Sharp differed uh, somewhat from what my colleagues were doing. Um, in my background, I have had experience using uh, C++. So I've had a uh, software development position where we're doing object-oriented uh, development in C++. But I've also been working a lot with Haskell. And my first job coming out of university was doing full-time development in Haskell. Uh, and when I started working with C Sharp, I noticed that a lot of the concepts I learned uh, and uh, was able to use in Haskell, I could again use in C Sharp. And I was using that quite heavily in some cases. And some of my colleagues were a little uncomfortable with that. Uh, they were seeing that the style I was writing in was, uh, to them, sort of strange uh, and very different from what they were doing. Uh, so that's sort of the source of this talk. I wrote this talk uh, for my colleagues, basically, to sort of, I don't know, perhaps a defense speech, but at least an explanation of where I was coming from and I, what I was, why I was doing what I was. Um, so hopefully this will be uh, interesting to you as well. How many here has experience of doing development in a functional language? Two, three? Okay, so very few of you. All right, object-oriented languages. How many of you have done that? <laughs> Someone has not done that? Right, yeah, I would sort of expect that. So um, first, I'm going to do a little very quick case study on a very simple statement, basically the for loop. This is something you do all the time, right? You use for loops for doing all kinds of things. And the first version here, I'll give a couple of different versions of it. The first version here is what you will typically do if you're working in C. So this is a loop where I have a, uh, basically an index variable, an integer, and I use that to loop over an array. Very simple, right? Something you would do all the time if you're working in C. If you're working in C++, you'll probably do this a little differently. You'll be using iterators quite a lot. When I was doing my uh, C++ development in that position, I was using this quite, quite heavily for many different things. And the nice thing about iterators is that it extracts away some of the uh, background for why we need this indexing in the first place. Here, you don't really care what the value or the exact index is. You just have this object or class that you use to abstract that part away. And this is very much an object-oriented approach to doing a very trivial thing. How many of you are doing C++ development? One, two, okay, a couple of you. Are you using iterators? You probably are, right? So there's another way of doing this now. When I was doing this in, uh, in C++, that was before the 2011 edition of C++. So things have happened here since I was doing this. Uh, but one thing that you will find in almost all languages these days is a for each statement. Again, a very trivial thing. And I assume most of you have been working with programming will be using this type of uh, looping a lot. And the nice thing about this is that it hides a lot of the information from the other two versions here. You don't really care about the iterator. You don't really care about what the index is. You just want to do something for every element of a set. That's what I'm doing here. So this is uh, uh, some, some form of set of customer names. I just want to print them on the command line. Is that a question? So, actually, this is almost always what I want. I would assume that more than 90% of my loops would be doing this. I'm almost never doing any of these. It's very special cases where I actually need that index. Any of you don't agree with that? No? Excellent. Now, what this talk is going to be uh, focusing on is this type of loops. If you, if you can all call it a loop. And I, will, I would uh, state that this is, very, this is sort of the functional approach to doing this looping. Instead of actually having this statement that traverses this set, I don't care how I traverse it, but I do, here I'm just saying that I have a function, and I want to apply that to every element of the list. It's a very trivial thing, but if you're very used to this, this can be sometimes a little intimidating, 
especially because one of the nice features of this is that you can compose them. You can put them in a series. Well, here I'm doing it for each, and I'm just writing it out, so I can't. But there are many oper other operations I can do here. I can do easily compose and build into a chain of operations. So this is what you would use in, in C Sharp. This is a link expression, and this will sort of be the focus of my talk here. Uh, have any of you ever worked with Haskell? A couple of you, okay. So all the code I'm going to write here, or show you, will be in Haskell. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a very, very brief introduction to Haskell, show you some of the syntax there, um, and talk about where these features come from. Because these have been around sort of in the functional paradigm forever, or since the 70s, whenever it was created. Uh, and then I'm going to do a, a case study where I'm going to solve a somewhat non-trivial problem using this type of constructs very heavily. And I hopefully it will give you sort of an idea of what, what this can do for you. <coughs> All right. So, Haskell. Functions in Haskell. What I'm going to do now is go, going to implement a very simple uh, function that summarizes uh, the elements of a list. How many of you, did any of you go to the uh, talk on category theories yesterday? A couple of you. Okay, so you'll recognize this because it is the exact same thing. I don't know if you're going to be angry about that or glad because it's a good example, but you will recognize this. <coughs> so, I'm going to write a function that summarizes all the integers in a list of ints. So this, uh, what you see on top here is what you, how you write a type declaration in Haskell. So you have a list of ints as an argument and it produces an int. And in Haskell, you would typically use uh, recursion and something called pattern matching. So if you're not familiar with pattern matching, this is a very nice feature that you find in most functional languages. <coughs> and basically what I do is this. I will split the implementation of this function into two different cases. One is the case where I have the empty list. It's very easy to summarize the elements of an empty list. I know that's zero. And then I have the recursive case where I pattern match on a non-empty list. So this n colon ns here means that I have one element, which I name n, which is the head of the list, then I have ns, which is the rest of the list. So now what I do is I simply take the first value, and I add that to what I get when I summarize the rest of the list. All right, pretty straightforward. Now let's do another implementation. And this time I'm going to do a function that concatenates a set of strings. So uh, it takes a set of strings as input, a list of strings, and returns one big concatenation of all of them. Now, when I start to implement this, I will see certain patterns here. So I'll start off with the empty list. Concatenation of the empty list, well, that's the empty string. And if I have a non-empty list, then I will take the first element and do concatenation. This is the concatenation operator in, uh, in Haskell. And I will concatenate that with what I get when I concatenate the rest of the list. As you can see, these two functions are very, very similar to each other. In fact, let's try to identify what the common aspects of them are. First thing is that we have a function. We have a function that takes two elements and combines them into one. Up at the top here is the addition operation. Down here is the concatenation operation. That's one difference. Second difference is that there's a base case here. At the top, we have zero, which is what we fall back on when we have the empty list. And on the other one, we have the empty string. And then finally, we have a list of values, which is the arguments that we take for this. So why don't we try to write a function that ca encapsulates this and captures the essence of what these two functions are doing? And we will call this the fold pattern. The idea here is to take this list and try to fold them into one, given, the, given a certain operations. And the signature for fold will look something like this. So fold, it takes a binary function, to plus in the sum int uh, case and uh, concatenation in the other one, and a base case, and the list of values. So now we can implement this function like this. So fold, and I use this underscore character. This is a very nice feature in Haskell as well. It allows you to say that I don't really care about the value of a certain argument here. So I don't care what the function is if I have an empty list. I just want to return the base case. And then the, in the recursive case, I will do like this. So I have a function f. 
I apply that to the first value of the list and what I get when I fold the rest of the list. So now we can use this function to express the two functions we already had. So for instance, I can express concatenation like this. So fold, concatenation of a certain list is the operation where I'm folding, giving the concatenation operator with the base case, the empty string. But I can also do things like this. So if I want to implement the sum operation, I can do a fold using plus and zero as the base case. Or I can do the product multiplication and one as the base case. Or I can use it for any other type. So I can, for instance, do an and. If I want to do an and of all the elements of a list of booleans, I can try the and operator and try true as the base case. So what did we just do here? Well, just like for each, the loop that we saw in the first, first slide here, captures a very common aspect of what you'd be doing on a set of values. Fold is another operation that is very common, commonly used. This is an operation that can be used for a lot of different stuff. And it sort of encapsulates a way, way of iterating over a set of values. And the nice thing is that you don't have to worry about exactly how that iteration is done. You just know that I'm doing a fold operation here. Well, this is my, my operator, and I know what the base case is. Now in Haskell, you have a lot of these patterns. In fact, this is a small excerpt, excerpt of some of the standard functions provided with Haskell. Um, <coughs> first one is map pair. It's probably the one that you would use the most. It takes a function on a list of values and just applies that function to all the values. Concat map, so the same, just produces a list and then joins the list for the result. Filter takes a predicate, a predicate function that returns a boolean and uh, returns all the values of a list that satisfies that predicate. Take while takes the first elements of the list as long as the predicate is true and so on. Uh, zip with takes a binary function, two arguments, and then two lists, and does a pairwise application of the function on the elements of the list. Iterate is sort of an interesting function. It takes a function and a starting value, sort of a seed, and then it produces a list where the first element is the uh, value where this function has been applied zero times. The second element is uh, this value, but with this applied once, and then twice and thrice and so on. The fold operations is what we just implemented. Actually, Haskell has two of these, uh, fold R and fold L. Uh, there's a little difference between them. This depends on what direction of the list you're starting to chewing up on. You can also see that the uh, signature acts a little more general than we did. And if you want to do some homework, you can go and uh, look at uh, how that can be. But that's, uh, that's not for this talk. So this set of operations is actually a really powerful tool. And many of the modern languages have taken them into their arms and have brought them into, into the languages. So in uh, uh, C-sharp, you have the link layer. Everybody here familiar with link? Yeah, many of you, all right. So link is all where this all started from my part. Um, in Java, you have this concept of streams. I'm not a Java developer myself, so if there's something wrong here, please, uh, uh, please feel free to comment on that. But you see many of these functions in Haskell map directly to what you see in, uh, in C-sharp and Java. Map, for instance, is called select in C-sharp. It's called map in Java, convenient. Uh, you have filter, you have take while. Actually, I couldn't find a take while operation in Java. I'm sure you can implement it yourself if you need it, though. Um, zip with, the set takes a function and two lists and pairwise applies that function to those uh, to the list. It's called zip in C sharp. Fold is called aggregate in C sharp. Reduce in uh, in Java. Um, actually, they match the fold L pattern, if I'm not mistaken. And iterate, iterate doesn't exist in C sharp, but it does exist in <coughs> in Java. It's very easy to implement it in C sharp, though. All right. How many of you are using these type of operations uh, on a daily basis? Many of you. All right. Perhaps I'm preaching to the choir here, but anyway, it's, it might be an interesting way to see how this can be applied. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, do a case study where I use these patterns to solve a, a sort of non-trivial problem, as I said. And the problem I'm going to look at is this, the eight queens problem. Are any of you here familiar with that problem? A couple of you. Have any of you solved it? You have. What language? Uh, 
Oh, you, you actually did it on the chessboard. All right, <laughs> nice. Okay, so the eight queries problem is this. We have a chessboard, eight times eight squares, and we want to take eight queens, and we want to place them on the chessboard so that no two queens threaten each other. This is sort of a uh, nice program exercise. Uh, I would assume some of the people will be doing this in university as part of a lab or something. <coughs> so, how would this work? Well, actually, one of the reasons why I picked this problem was that when I was when I had my position where I was doing C++ development, I had a colleague that was uh, curious about Haskell and functional programming, so he wanted to uh, take a take a stab at it, and he started with this problem. And he wanted to use this as a, a case study for him to learn the language itself. And if you were to do this in an object-oriented approach, um, my first spontaneous reaction would be, I want to have some sort of object that models a chessboard, and I will think about what kind of operations that would need. That was his approach as well. So the first thing he did was, OK, I will need a two-dimensional array, because that's what a chessboard is. So he started asking me, how do I use arrays in Haskell? And the answer is you probably don't. Haskell doesn't really have arrays. You have lists in Haskell, and you can use them to sort of model arrays, but you will not get that constant lookup time that you're looking for in arrays typically. Uh, but we had a long discussion on, on that part of sort of the problem. And I sort of felt that his approach was starting in the wrong end. So after we had a discussion, uh, I went home, and in the evening I sort of, hey, I want to try to solve this myself. And I wrote a solution that is somewhat similar to what, what I'm going to present here. So my first thought was, was this. What should a solution look like? How would I represent the solution for this problem? And there's one thing I needed to know about, about this solution. I know that there will never be two queens in the same column. So why don't we use that aspect and just say that, OK, I want a solution to be a list of the row positions of the queens in each column. So a, a solution here is has a type list of ints, and I want to write this function. I want to write a function that creates this list. And one typical solution, or one potential solution, what you're seeing here, is this one. It's three, one, six, two, four, seven, four, zero. Right? That is one solution to this problem. So let's start looking at how to write this problem now. Well, I went for the strategy I was going for was some kind of greedy algorithm. Uh, I was not looking for a great performance or anything. I just want to solve the problem. So what I will do is I will write the function that just creates all solutions, and then I'll take the first. So where do we start? Well, the empty solution, of course. We start with the solution where we have no queens on the chessboard. That's very easy. There's one solution to doing that. That is a solution where we don't have any queens. It's an empty list. Where do we end? Well, we want to have a solution where we have eight queens on the board, one in each column. And what functions will we need to solve this? Well, we have to do some sort of search, right? Search of the search base here. Um, so what I'm going to do is I want to have write a, pro a function that takes an incomplete solution and extends that with one queen. So the first, I will start off with the empty list. I want to write a function that will give me all solutions where I have a, a queen in the first column, and so on. So that would be expressed something like this. So for a given partial solution, we create all possible extensions. So here we have one partial solution of the solution we saw earlier. We have a queen in row 0, 4, and 7. So the way we go about doing this now is simply we will try all the position. So let's just try queens for all the rows. And then we start chewing them off. We start with the first one here and ask, is this OK to add? Is it OK to add a queen at row 0 given this partial solution? It isn't, exactly. So how do we fi find that out? Well. We need to do a couple of things. First, we want to check this diagonal here. Is there, a di is there any queen on this diagonal up, up here? No, there isn't. That's OK. But there is one here. So that is not OK. We remove that one. Then we take the next one. Is it OK to add to row 1? Well, it's OK to add up. It's OK to add level, or horizontally. 
and it's okay to add down. Fine, we keep that one. Next one, is this one okay to add? No, it's not, it hits that queen. And then we continue like this. What we end up with are these two solutions. There's actually two extensions, possible extensions to the partial solution we had. And those are 1740 and 5740. So we want to write this function that takes this partial solution and generates this list of partial solutions. So, how do we do that? Well, the function signature, we can start by looking at this predicate here. Because we see immediately that we want some function that checks whether or not a certain queen is okay to add. So let's start with that one. This okay to add is a function that takes a queen position at a certain row, candidate for an extension, and a partial solution, which is a list of ints, and returns a boolean stating it whether or not it's okay to add that queen there. All right, so example, okay to add zero should be false, as we just saw, okay to add one should be true. So how do we do that? Well, we already saw that there are three cases to this. There's the okay to add up, okay to add down, and okay to add level. So why don't we just split it into these three cases? So a divide and conquer strategy for doing this. Then we can start to look at one of these particulars. Let's start to look at the first one here, okay to add up. <coughs> or when we have all of these, we can actually express the okay to add like this. So it's okay to add a certain queen to a set of queens, to part of solution, if all of these three functions return true. We just do an and on all of them. So let's start to implement this first one here. Okay to add up. So how would we do that? Well, first thing we can do is to look at what this diagonal will be. You know there's going to be a diagonal up here. So why don't we try to extract what that diagonal is? So we start off with a queen at position one here, q equals one, and then we move one step up to the right, and I increment this value, so we get a two. So then we go another step up to the right, and we get three. And another step, and we increment each time, and we end up with this list, two, three, four. So why would we want that? Well, once we have that, we've actually re reduced the problem to just performing a pairwise comparison between this diagonal and the set of queens we have here. So we can express OK to add one to seven, four, zero to just comparing these two lists. All right, so back to the concept of functional patterns, because there are a lot of patterns here that uh, I have some convenient tools for doing. First of all, the one thing I want to be doing here is to create this diagonal. That is the iterate pattern. So iterate, just repeat that. It takes a function and a starting seed and creates a list where I apply the, um, uh, the function uh, multiple times. So if I do iterate, and then the successor function, this is sort of a fancy name for doing plus one when you're using it on integers. <coughs> but if you apply this, you will get a list that looks like this. Start with one, then you get two, three, four, and so on forever. It's actually an infinite list, but there's no interesting concept in Haskell, but I'm not, not going to talk much about that. And we need the other um, uh, pattern, which is to perform a pairwise comparison. That is basically a zip with. The zip width takes a binary function and two lists and applies this function to pairs of values in this list. So if I do like this, zip width, and this is the inequality operator in Haskell, so it means the difference from, on these two lists, then what we'll do is try to compare 7 to 2, 4 to 3, 0 to 4. And I will end up with this list, true, true, true. And when it reaches the end of this list, it will just ignore the rest of that list. So now we can define our OK to add up like this. OK to add up takes a queen and a partial solution, and we start by creating the uh, diagonal, iterate successor on the queen position. We take tail here, we, we drop the first element because you won't don't want to have this position that we actually started from, looking at the <coughs> diagonal behind the uh, column where we are. So we do that, and then we set that with the inequality and a partial solution. And then finally we just do AND on the whole, whole list. AND here we take all of these elements and returns true if all of them are true. 
The dollar sign here is also some curious Haskell syntax, but it's just a convenient way of not having to write as many parentheses. <coughs> it's actually a, a function. It's a function that takes a function and an argument and applies the function to the argument. It's sort of a weird function, but it's uh, nice because uh, this allows you to, uh, well, because of how precedence is taken care of in Haskell, it means that this is applied to everything behind it. So I don't have to have a lot of parentheses there. Yes? Ah, uh, no, no, I, d I don't in this case because I have the, the order here will be from this is the last element. Yeah. All right, so now I have the OK to add up function. Next step would be to write a function for doing OK to add down. And, you know, it's going to be very, very similar. The only difference is that I'm not going up anymore, I'm going down. So instead of doing iterate successor function, or suck, I will do iterate predecessor function, pred. So now when you see two different functions that are identical except for one single value, you should think, I want to write a function that encapsulates this, right? So why don't we write a higher order function, a function that takes this uh, successor or predecessor operator or function as an input. Then we can write that like this. It's almost identical implementation, but the difference is that we have this function here, right? It takes an int and creates a next int in the, in the diagonal. Because then we can write like this. We just have the f here and replace the function we did with f here. So now we have a function called OK to add given direction, or there. So now we have one function left to write, and that is the OK to add level. But you know, that can also be written with this function. What function should we use when we're implementing OK to add level? The identity function, exactly. The identity function is sort of a curious thing in Haskell as well. And people working in, in C Sharp probably will be sort of unfamiliar with that. <coughs> but the identity function is a function that just takes an argument and returns it. It doesn't do anything. It's sort of a curious function, but we can use it here. And actually, you'll find that when you are working with higher order functions and these type of patterns, this is something that turns up quite a lot. In this case, it'll be like, adding zero, right? You will never write a, a line of code that adds zero, but you quite often have functions that takes a value that you add, and that value could be zero, right? Similar with functions, if you return a function something, sometimes you want to return a function that doesn't do anything. So this is uh, something from the functional world that is very, uh, very convenient in many cases. It doesn't exist in C-sharp by default, but it's very easy to define it. I don't know about Java. Do you have an id function in Java? You do, okay, nice. So now we have these three functions. And if you go back to the original OK to add function, it looks like this. So we have these three cases. We can now simply replace them with these functions. So now we don't need the particulars, the OK to add up and down and a level, we just have this OK to add there all the time. But if we look at this now, we can see that what we are actually doing here is that we are applying this function, OK to add different direction, and a queen and a partial solutions to three, three different values. So we suck, pred, and id, and we want to check that it's true for all those values. Well, that is actually a pattern in itself. So why don't we take these three functions and extract them to a list? So we create this list with the successor, the predecessor, and the identity function. Because when we have this, this all boils down to do applying that operation to all of those values. And a check if all elements of a list satisfy the predicate, that's the pattern all. All takes a function, it takes a value, returns a bool, and returns true if all of those values are true for the list. So if I, for instance, do all even on 2, 4, 6, I will get true, right? So if I use this pattern, I can express OK to add like this. It's okay to add a queen at a certain row for this uh, partial solution if it's okay to add given direction for all of these functions. Everybody okay with that? Yes, a question? Yeah. 
That is a good point. You, yeah. There are two aspects to that. The first one is that, uh, yes, you might want to actually have some sort of uh, a value representing the direction here that is more direct than this. Actually, you can just do an alias. You can, you can call suck for up and pred for, for down or something, and you can use those. That would be actually, uh, could be a nice solution. But also, one of my points uh, with this talk is that many of these functions are, if not unknown, then people are not sort of, they're not spontaneously grabbing for these tools when they're doing their programming. And I find that being sort of fluent in these type of constructions makes me a, a more efficient programmer because I can reach for this in a very easy manner. And also I find that these patterns here that we're seeing, fold and, and all and zip with and all of these, they're very convenient tools for also communicating with each other. M I assume everybody here are familiar with the concept of object-oriented patterns. If I told you I was implementing a factory pattern, you would know pretty much immediately what I was talking about. And I find that something similar goes with these patterns here. Because they talk about how you operate on different sets of values. And if you are familiar with these, it's, it's much easier to read this because you're familiar. I know all, oh, okay, but I know exactly what I'm doing. I see a fold, okay, I know that I'm compressing this list into one single value. So I think there's value in that as well. And, and yes, for someone who's not familiar with, with Haskell or functional programming, this would be cryptic. But I also think that once you have some experience with using this, you will not find that cryptic anymore. Yes, question? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the so the question is if uh, if currying is involved. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the concept of currying. Uh, but Haskell has a very nice concept called partial application. And that is Actually, that's the one feature in uh, Haskell that I miss the most when I'm working in C-sharp. So what you can do in Haskell, you can actually think of all functions as taking exactly one argument. So this all can be seen as a function that takes this predicate and returns a new function. A function that takes a list of values and returns a bool. And the nice thing about doing that is you don't have to actually apply all the values. You can do just a partial application. So what I've done here is I've added the value, uh, added the parameters Q and the QS, and the result is that I get, I don't have the, uh, um, I can go to the next slide. Here we go. The result is that I get a function that takes a function and returns this uh, Boolean. It's a very nice thing, especially when you're working with this set, because you don't have to have all these lambda expressions. At least you don't have to, have to have them explicitly as you do in C-sharp, but they are sort of under the hood there, I guess, anyway. Um, all right. Any other questions? No? <coughs> so this is where we are so far. We have two functions. We have this OK to add given direction, and we have the OK to add, which takes a queen and a partial solution and returns a boolean, stating whether or not it's OK to add that queen. All right. Next step. Yes? <laughs> yes, I can read this code. Yeah, yeah. There, there is an uh, argument to that, though, um, and that was some of the things my colleagues were reacting to because as I was using this quite a lot, they found it hard to read, read the code. So, and if you do this very heavily, you will end up situation where it is very difficult to read it. So you have to use this sort of with care. Um, and know when to split things and know how that naming your functions will be important to sort of encapsulate what they're actually doing. One thing you can probably do here to make this easier is this one, this tail iterate FQ thing. You might want to create a function for that that actually says create diagonal or something. That might ease readability. Um, but yeah, with care, efficient but with care. So next up. I now want to write this function that extends a solution. So the idea is to have a function with this signature here. It takes a partial solution as an argument and returns a list of all the 
uh, extensions for that partial solution. So how would we do that? Well, let's look at some different steps to take here. First of all, we want to create this list of all the different row positions. So we have to try all of them, 0 through 7. Then we want to take only those queens that are OK to add. And here we can see that the OK to add predicate will come in handy. And finally, we want to create all extensions uh, based on those queens that are OK to add. So what patterns do we need for this? Well, first we want to create this list of values from 0 th through 7. This is very easy. Most languages have a construct from this. Uh, but in uh, Haskell, you write like this. So 0 dot dot 7 will give you the list 0 through 7. 0, 1, 2, and so on. Next step, we want to take only those queens that are OK to add. Now this is a very typical pattern that you'll be using quite a lot, which is filter. Filter takes a predicate and the list of values and returns you the list of values in that original list that satisfies the predicate. So for instance, if I do filter even on 0 through 7, I will get this list 0, 2, 4, 6. All right. And then finally, I want to create extensions based on those queens that are OK to add. So when I've done this filtering, I will end up in the list that I can add. And I want to add all of them to the, um, uh, the partial solution I had. That is the function map. So map takes a function and the list and applies that function to all the values. So if I, for instance, do map times 2 on 1, 2, 3, I get 2, three, two 4, 6, right? So using these operations here, I can, refine, I can uh, define extend solutions like this. So extend solutions takes my partial solution, and I start off by creating all the row positions. Then I filter out the ones that are OK to add, given my partial solution. The back ticks here are used to uh, make this function infix. In, in, in particular, it will bind this to the second argument of my function here. So this will give me the list of extensions. So in the previous case, it would be 1 and 5. And then I want to add all of them to the partial solution I had to create this set of new extended partial solutions. So I just map, map cons qs. This is a function that takes a value and adds it to that ahead of the list. So this is the function that creates all extensions for a given partial solution. So now I want to use this somehow. So now I want to create all solutions. And how would we do that? Well, the first step would be to start off with the base case, right? With the empty list, empty solution. And we want to extend, create, apply extend solution to that. What that would give us is this list of all the different ways I can place a queen in the first row, or zeroth row, column, sorry. Then I want to apply extend solution again on all those partial solutions, which will give me a list of lists of extensions. So one set of extensions where I uh, had a queen in row, uh, in row zero, one set of extensions where I had one, one, and so on. Then I want to take all this list and just combine them into one. So we get this one. Two zero is a po possible partial solution, three zero and so on. I couldn't have one zero right, because that would be in conflict. Zero zero wouldn't go either. Now I just do this until I'm done. I repeat this process. Now this list, I'll apply extend solution to all of them again. I'll do this over and over again until I've added eight queens, and then I'm done. All right, so let's implement that. I'm going to implement a function called all solutions that takes an integer, which is the number of queens I want to add, and it returns the list of all possible ways to add that many queens to the first n positions, n columns of the board. So how do we write that? Well, we're going to do this with recursion now. We start off with all solutions for zero queens. That's very easy, we've already seen that. There's one solution for that, and that is the empty solution. Next, <coughs> we want to do a recursive case. So we want to create all solutions with n minus 1 queens and extend all of them. So creating n minus 1 queens, that's easy. That's just all solutions n minus 1. It's a recursive step, right? And then we want to extend solutions on all of them. So you map extend solution on all these. 
that we give us a list of lists of partial solutions. Nice. And then we just concatenate them and group them all together. It gives us one big list of potential candidates. This is actually a quite common pattern as well, that you use concat map at the same time, because this will produce a list here, and we just want to group them into one. So we can use this function here, concat map. In C sharp, this is called select many. So concat map, extend solutions, and all this. So now we have this function here. All solutions can be expressed like this. All right. Hmm. I'm applying a function multiple times here. There's a pattern for that. Anybody remember? What? Four? No, not really. It's iterate. I'm iterating here. Doing the same thing over and over again. I want to apply this function eight times. Iterate takes a function and a seed and creates a list where the first seed or the zeroth element has this function applied zero times, first element has it applied one times, second has it applied two times, and so on. Eighth element, you know what? It will have it applied eight times. So all I need to do is actually iterate this function here, concat map extend solutions, and take the eighth element. Like this. So I iterate concat map extend solution. My seed will be the empty solution. And when I implement this all solutions n, I can write like this. Iterate concat map extend solutions, and I'll just take the nth element. So this is Haskell syntax for indexing in a list. So then I end up with this, Im this implementation. So all solutions takes a number of queens, and it rates this function here, and I take the nth value. So now we're almost done. What we need to do is wrap things up here. So we have a function where it returns all solutions for n queens. What we want is a solution, one solution, for eight queens. So we just do this. All solutions and provided with eight, and then we take the first element, head. And then we're done. Everybody okay with that? So what we end up with, solution, is this. That's the entire solution. How many are surprised at how short it is? A couple of you. I am. Always when I get to the slide, I'm sort of happy. I sort of feel, where did all the code go? <laughs> I actually did one small uh, modification here. Uh, all solutions do doesn't take the, an argument anymore. Instead, I moved that indexing up to all solutions. It didn't really make sense there. It's just easier to explain when I'm going through it. Uh, so what is my point here? Is it that you should always write like this? No, it's not. But what I hope to do, do by this is to sort of raise the uh, level of consciousness with regards to this type of construct, because sometimes they are very, very efficient. You can express very nice things with them. And I can give you a little demo here of what it actually looks like when you run it. Let's see. So here is the solution written in Emacs. And I will bring this one up here. Let's see. So here I'm using uh, um, uh, a Haskell interpreter that you can use on the command lines. So now I can just type solution, and I get this solution out. So this is the same solution that I actually had on the first slider, 3, 1, 6, 2, 5, and so on. Or I can do like this. Then I get all the possible solutions with eight queens. Or I can do things like this. I can add uh, length to this now. And I can ask how many solutions are there. There are 92 solutions. It's actually quite few when you think of it. Actually, there are less than this. If there's someone here who's interested to follow up on this problem, you can reduce this because there are a lot of symmetries in the chessboard and you can sort of rotate and flip and stuff like that. So you can reduce that uh, quite a lot. Or then I can also do things like this now. If I continue to use the, uh, the patterns I'm doing here, I can ask, for instance, what's the length of the first 10 solutions? So I can take 10 from this, and then I map length on those. I will get this list. So here we have a sort of nice function. 
And this will be what we have for eight uh, queens. After that, it comes to zero. There's no way to add nine queens to a chessboard, right? And all the values after that will be zero. And I can also do things like, if you want to see more general what uh, this looks like, you can do something like this. Let's see. Here, I get some nice indexing on them as well. So here you can see that which, how many queens there are in each pot. It peaks around five, and then it starts going down again. If there's someone who's mathematically savvy in the room, I'm sure you could write some sort of formula to capture that. It's all an interesting aspect. Makes, makes me curious to go further. How, how would this look like for like, you know, nine, chessboard nine times nine? You could do that as well. All right, any questions? Yes? Well, um, yes, I, I was. Uh, I'm not. This talk isn't really about performance, yeah. uh, but there are obviously a lot of things you can do here. This is not the most efficient way of solving this. So, if you want to sort of do an algorithmic reasoning on how to solve this problem, I'm sure you can find better ways to do that. One thing you can even to see. I started off saying that we know that there's always exactly one queen in each column, but we know that there's ac actually exactly one queen in each row as well. So I don't have to try all the positions. If I start off with this list, actually, I want I know that there's going to be exactly one queen in each column and row. So I can start off with sort of the values, zero through seven, and I know that this final solution will be some sort of permutation of those values. I'm sure you could use that to make it much more efficient. And I'm sure there's other ways to do that as well that would be much more efficient. Uh, my experience, though, from, from doing programming is that yeah. when, when I was doing the C++ coding, I was working in a... Uh, on an optimizer for, we are actually building a, a tool that was doing uh, optimization for uh, uh, distribution of personnel on plane routes for plane companies, like uh, Lufthansa and SAS. Um, and there, there was a lot of optimizations going on for doing those algorithms. But still, in my everyday life, I was doing a lot of things that were just uh, data transforming to provide the correct data to the actual engine doing the hard work. And there was never a problem with performance there. I'm very much a fan of this um, premature optimization is the root of all evil. Don't do an optimization unless you have to. Do it easy, doing, doing it readable. I know some of have a hard time melting this one. Uh, but I find that is much more important than performance, almost always. Of course, there will be cases where that is not the case. Uh, but then you can go back to see, okay, what was the bottleneck here? How do I deal with that? Any other questions? Any comments? All right. So I'm pretty much done. So what I would like you to take home with you, if you're not already if you're comfortable with using links in the C Sharp or streams in Java, have a look at them and see what they can do for you. Keep them in mind, because I feel that this is a very nice toolkit to have in your everyday life when you're working with, uh, with programming. Yes? This one? This solution? I presented it to them, and uh, um, yeah, I don't know what effect I've had on you guys, but it's, it's, it's probably similar, I would guess. Yes? I I haven't actually the original. I did a presentation on this uh, in Sweden a couple of weeks ago as well, and it was a little longer because I had a long introduction where I talked more about sort of the. Um, Aspects that uh, that you will find in, for instance, C sharp that comes from the uh, from the functional wall. There I was doing some uh, uh, comparison. If I implement this in Haskell, it could look like this. If I did it in C sharp, it could look like this. Uh, it would be interesting to see how this would look in uh, in C sharp. It wouldn't be as short, and one of the big reasons is this thing that you can uh, do partial application on this. But it will be pretty short there as well, I'm sure. Yes, another question.
I absolutely agree. I agree with you, though. Uh, my goal here is not to write something that is as obfuscated as possible. What, I'm, what my goal is to show how these operations can be used. And what I find is that I very often will, I rarely do a solution where I use this throughout the entire problem, but I will use them at a lot of different small locations. I will use select statements instead of uh, for loops and all of this. Uh, and you will have to have some sort of uh, yeah, notion of which, which level you want to put it on. But I feel that one really nice thing about this is that it actually it captures what you want to do. If we go back to the original part where I talked about for each loop, I know that when I see a simple, I know what it's doing. I know that when I see a for each, I'm looping something over all the objects. If I say an iterator loop, I need to look at a lot of different spots to understand what is going on. Am I doing plus plus on the iterator or minus minus? Am I using that iterator object later on in the in the uh, in the loop? It hides a lot of the information in the background and focusing what you're actually doing, not how you're doing it. So yes, when you are not familiar with these, with these objects or these, uh, this set way of writing, it will be harder to read. When you are, you probably don't, you're not going to think of that anymore. As a hy hypothesis for me, you might feel free to disagree, of course. Any other questions? Yes? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there are multiple ways. It depends on what you want to do. Uh, probably you want to have an argument, a solution, where you say how large is the chessboard. Then you have to propagate that value down to there where you uh, treat it. Or you can just extract it as a constant and say that chessboard size is 8 times 8, right? Then you can use that. And then you have to recompile every time you run it. But yeah, there's a lot of ways to extend this if you want to take it further. I was sort of curious what it would look like in a cube. <laughs> What's a chess cube look like? Right? That could be another thing to do. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>